If there was one word that you could use to describe a narcissist, what would it be? Just one word. Let me know in the comments. Now I've asked this question of dozens of my students and the same common theme keeps emerging. Control. It's all about control. They have to be in control. They have to have control. They want to be in control of everyone and everything. They have to control how you see them and more importantly, what you provide for them. And whether they are the overtly obnoxious narcissist or the covertly manipulative one, their game is still the same. Control. So what I want to talk about today is how they do this. I want to talk to you about uh, today as we dive into our day 10 of the 12 toxic days of Christmas. We're talking about how the covert narcissist controls you through disorientation. Now, have you ever felt disoriented? Many years ago, I took ice skating lessons and I know this is going to sound silly, but you know, when when I was growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. My parents did the best they could, but I wasn't able to take, you know, lessons in things like I wanted to, like piano and music. And, and I was very much into sports. I was, I was a total athlete at heart. So when I got older and I was able to now do these things on my own, I took advantage of them. I took dancing lessons. I took ice skating lessons and I absolutely loved these. So I worked with a coach. And she would kind of walk me through this process. And one day she says, I think you're ready for a spin. So this is great. I've always seen these spins and I'm like, oh, it's absolutely beautiful. And of course, what you have in your mind that you're going to look like is actually very different, especially on your first time. So she sets me up and she teaches me how to actually get into the spin. And I was so excited. I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But at the same time, I'm recognizing I have no idea where I am. I felt so disoriented. And when I came out of the spin, it certainly wasn't this graceful exit that you see. It was more of this clunky, disoriented, where am I? It was kind of scary actually, because if you've ever fell on the ice, that's not a, it's not a fun time. But the reason I paint that picture is because narcissists do the same thing. They're the type that can take a normal everyday interaction and make you feel like you've been spun around a dozen times blindfolded and then pushed out into the middle of the highway. And by the time you come to, you don't know what hit you. And then if you have the audacity, or should I say the foolishness to ask the narcissist, what just happened? You're going to be gaslit into believing that you caused it. Some way, somehow, by the way you spoke to them or how you delivered it or how you reacted or something that you said or did, you were the problem here. And remember, you're all disoriented. So yeah, being the good person that you are, you're thinking, uh, okay, is that true? The truth is it's actually part of their game. Please let me know in the comments if you have ever experienced this before. They have to cause disorientation because they have no interest in facing the truth. So how do they do this? Well, I want to walk you through a few different ways. I know the title says that there were three ways, but I'm going to throw in a fourth. So we're going to talk about four ways today. So the first is through volatility. They love to use intimidation. Now, the intimidation can come in a couple of different forms. Number one, they can be very uh, abrasive. They can be very reactive. And if you have any type of uh, codependency issues, if you struggle with being intimidated by people, if you struggle with any kind of people-pleasing qualities, you may just go ahead and back down because they came out so forcefully. That's one way to do it. The second way is they love to intimidate you through their tears. Yes. So you would think that you're actually looking at this, this weak, fragile individual, but it's all a game. So they'll start to cry and get very upset and, and they'll be so volatile, like they won't even know how to express themselves because they have no self-regulation. And that's where the volatility is coming from. So 
you wonder, oh, well, wait a minute. Okay. Like, why is this person crying? Because healthy people cry when something is wrong, but narcissists cry, number one, if they want to manipulate you, number two, because they can't self-regulate. They need to regulate themselves through you so they can now feel stable. So if you do not respond in the way that helps to stabilize them, you're going to get met with number two, which is the emotional roller coaster. So oftentimes they're okay, not oftentimes, all the time. Their goal is to get you in line with thinking, feeling, and acting the way they want. Remember, it's all about control. My friend, if you're taking notes, just put a control, put just write control down, capital letters, bold it, asterisk, underline it, highlight it, do whatever you have to do. It's all about control for them. So their reaction is going to be an attempt to control the situation and to control you. And they do this through their emotions. They are not stable people. So what makes you think the relationship is going to be stable? So here's the biggest mistake that I see a lot of people make when trying to negotiate, rationalize, um, talk through anything with a narcissist is you're looking at them like number one, they are somebody who cares and they're somebody who gets it and they are somebody who cares to get it. They don't. And that's why conversations with them can feel so disorienting because they're just looking to spin you around. I want you to imagine this. They're, they're like the, the toxic person that just takes a, a pile of spaghetti, throws it at the wall and just hopes that something sticks. That's all they're looking to do. But you're focusing on the pile of spaghetti that was just thrown at you. And you're like, oh, I can't take this. Okay, never mind. Mission accomplished. Emotional roller coaster, volatility, instability. My friend, they are not stable people. Your relationship with them will not be stable. That does not mean that you don't put up boundaries. That does not mean that you don't guard your heart because you're responsible for your own stability. So you're responsible for not letting them get to you. You're not responsible, however, for trying to change them or trying to get them to get it. They don't want to get it. <laughs> I actually reached a point where I had to remind myself, this was a long time ago. I said, Chris, they don't want to get it. When are you going to get it? And that's what I want to say to you. When are you going to get it? They don't want to get it. They're not interested. So number three is they use deflection. Oh, my friend, they're going to bring up everything and everything, or I should say anything and everything, especially that's non-related. They're going to bring up your issues, related or unrelated. They're going to bring up your problems, past, present, or even potentially in the future. They're going to bring up what they're going through as though to imply that you are such an insensitive person or being so inconsiderate of what they're going through and what they're dealing with. And this is meant to cause a disorientation. So if you're in a constant battle where you're getting everything thrown at you, remember, they're going to use deflection, kind of like those Wonder Woman things. She, you know, she, she kind of raised them to offset the bullet somewhere else. Well, they do that constantly. Anything you bring to them, which you think you're bringing to them in a healthy manner. Hey, you know what you said, or you did this, that, that bothered me. And I want to be able to talk about it. Or, you know, this is a dynamic in our relationship that I'm really not feeling very good about. They're not going to be the type that says, oh, um, okay, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, I'm a little caught off guard, but I, I want to be able to hear you. So let's, let's sit down and talk about it. Or even in the future, I don't really have time now, but you know, do you want to talk about it later tonight or this weekend? That's how a healthy person is going to respond. A toxic person is going to, is going to come at with every single deflection. Oh, like you don't think I have problems with you. Oh, you like, you think you're perfect or, oh, great with all the other things that I've got going on right now, this is what you want to do to me. And they're looking to deflect it right back onto you. You're the problem. You're the problem for even bringing this up to me. How dare you? They look to take no personal responsibility. 
They are the type that is going to take a small disagreement or a small dissatisfaction, and they're going to twist it into an overwhelming, controlling, freakish interaction that positions them as the victim if you keep coming at them. And all you're looking to do is try to bring resolve. Scripture tells us that we are to address all the little foxes before they spoil the vineyard. But here's the problem that you can run into in being, a rela- being in a relationship with a narcissist is you should be able to address these things. You should be able to bring them up, the little issues, and they should be just that. They should be little issues that you maybe take a few minutes to talk about. Uh, Maybe it gets to a point where you're just like, all right, we're, we're at an impasse here. Maybe we go to counseling. Maybe we go to our pastor. But you're looking to work through these issues. But here's the problem. Most people have allowed the volatility of a narcissist to cause them to back down. You know, they'll actually make, maybe you'll make a a passive aggressive comment, which is not appropriate, by the way, you know, and making a comment about how, you know, they always seem to leave the dirty work for you to do. And and they hear that comment, no, I don't. How dare you say that? I do this and blah, 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 blah. And, And you're like, I'm not interested in a fight. I really just wanted you to be able to help me a little bit. Now, that's partly your responsibility, not your fault, your responsibility for being able to communicate what your needs and desires are in a healthier manner. Not that they're going to get met any better with a narcissist. However, they're now successful in intimidating you to back down. Now, if that intimidation doesn't work, then they may pour on the tears. And if you've ever noticed that, please let me know in the comments. First, they're going to start with their bullying and their intimidation. They're going to try to get you to back down. And let's say that you've developed this strength and this fortitude and you just, you don't get sucked into it anymore. And you're saying, well, no, actually you said this. And um, I actually recorded that conversation. Or actually, if you recall, this is what you said at this particular time. And -and so-and-so was right there. Now what you've done is you've backed them into a corner. Mm. Not a good position for a narcissist. Now I'm not saying that you don't do that but they don't take too kindly to being proven wrong. Because remember, they just want to create this smoke screen. They're going to take you through the emotional roller coaster. They're going to try the volatility. They're going to do the deflection. And then when that's not working, they're going to uh, revert to another form of manipulation, which now goes back to that volatility, which is the crying. So now you've completely backed them into a corner. Now they're this wounded puppy that is a complete victim of yours. So you will always be the problem, my friend. In some ways, they do know that what they're doing is not healthy behavior. That in some ways, they do know that this is not a healthy way of interacting. But if they can convince themselves that this is the best approach, and more importantly, if they can convince you, and the only way that they're going to convince you is by getting you to agree to back down then what they do is they further solidify in their mind the delusion that you are the problem. Because even if you are a tiny part of the problem, and let's be honest, we all are. If you're in a relationship with a toxic person or a narcissist, at some point, you're going to bring some of your problems to the table. Your frustration, your passive aggressiveness, your lashing out, your your own form of manipulation. At some point, this is going to rise to the surface. And that is why I am always proclaiming to you guys to deal with your own stuff. Not that it's going to change them. That should not be the goal. But number one, you always want to be on a path of personal, spiritual, emotional, mental development and growth. Always. If you are in Christ, you should always be growing. Remember, it is his desire to transform you through the, renew- through, the, the <laughs> through the renewing of your mind. But if we're not allowing our minds to be renewed and now we're getting caught in the toxic dynamic, well, guess what? We stay just as stuck as they are. And just because we're not as toxic as they are doesn't mean that we're not toxic in and of ourselves. So I digress for a moment. I, I just want to drive that point home. Let God deal with with whatever's going on inside of you. Do not be part of the toxic tango. So in some ways, 
they actually know that they are not healthy people. On the other side, they have no clue because they've been interacting on this level for so long that it's just second nature to them. And they've likely surrounded themselves with people that either go along with their, their volatility or are too immature to actually see what these people are really about. Or they just have a tendency to constantly flip relationships to be able to keep the supply fresh. And what happens is in that process, they further enforce in their minds, you're the problem. Because after all, you're the only one that's got really the problem with them. You know, this new group of friends that I've got over here, they don't have any issue with me. These people at work, they think I'm a shining star. Well, guess what? They only see you once in a while and they are able to only see the mask that you portray. You can't uphold the mask around me for that long. They don't experience the same abuse that you have given to me. So, but in their mind, as long as other people don't see them that way, yeah, you must be the problem. So do they believe their own line of baloney? Yes, they do. Number four, they love the guilt. Guilt has to be a go-to for them. They love attention and they will do anything and everything to get attention. And they will use guilt to play the victim. And whenever that fails, they'll likely resort to stonewalling. If you don't know what stonewalling it is, it's a form of manipulation that withdraws from the person with the intent of causing emotional and mental discomfort in the other person. Now, some narcissists will say, I'm not stonewalling, I just need time to myself. No, no, no. There's a difference between saying, hey, you know what? I'm a little overwhelmed right now and I really don't know how to handle this. And and in fact, quite honestly, I may need to go talk to a counselor. So I just need some time away because this conversation isn't going very well. Do you mind if we take some space? And then you set a date and a time to be able to get back together. The intent behind all that is to still communicate love and an interest in the relationship. Stonewalling is like, Things ain't going the way I want them to, I'm done with you. That's what stonewalling does. It is probably the most disrespectful and damaging things that could happen to a relationship. I have never seen a relationship survive with a stonewaller because there is no relationship right there. And it's a form of manipulation. So let's kind of backtrack a little bit. First, they start off with the guilt. They're going to pull at your heartstrings. They're going to play the victim and it usually works because it's worked for so long. They're the type of person that will, you know, convince you that, oh, they haven't had something in so long in order to pull at your heartstrings to get you to pay for it and buy it for them. Or they're the type of person that will just be like, oh, you know what? I'm just so overwhelmed and I've got so much going on that I just can't deal with any of this right now. Guilt. So now it's your responsibility now to back off on your needs and desires for a healthy relationship so they can stay in their comfort zone. They will use guilt at any cost. Now, if you're not giving them what they want, oh, the, the guilt that they will pull is endless. Guys, in fact, I'm not even going to get into the examples. I want to encourage you, let me know in the comments how the narcissist has used guilt in your life to pull at your heartstrings or try to get you to do what they want. Guilt is a go-to for them. And in their mind, it is the ultimate form of control. But here's the interesting part. (laughs) The narcissist will always call you the controlling one. And in their mind, it's actually accurate because they feel like they're being controlled. But remember, our feelings aren't always facts. So the narcissist is now being approached by you with some of the issues that are taking place within the relationship. Your desire is for repair and restoration, but they're hearing, you're trying to tell me what to do. You are trying to control the narrative. Everything's got to be on your terms, doesn't it? And that's why they actually believe that you're the controlling one. And meanwhile, you're sitting here scratching your head going, uh, wait a minute, we're in this issue because you're the controlling one. 
Now, be foolish enough to actually say that and forget it. You're back to number one with the volatility and the spaghetti thrown at the wall. And next thing you know, you're so disoriented that you have no idea what the actual issue was that you even brought up. And in your mind, you're like, oh, this isn't worth it. And that is the goal of the narcissist. That's how they control you through disorientation because they know it is overwhelming for you. It's not overwhelming for them. They don't care. They're twisting in a thousand different directions and they're not stable people. So they don't feel disoriented when they lose their stability because they don't have it to begin with. And here's why you may feel like you're losing your mind. You love this person and you likely want to handle these issues in a healthy, godly manner but it's not the case with the narcissist. You go ahead and damage their self-ego and all bets are off. And my friend, it doesn't take much to damage their self-ego. Tell them that they did something wrong or, or tell them that you want to see something better in a relationship or let them know how what they said or did impacted you in a negative way. And that's it. That fragile shell is shattered and they are exposed. They're not looking for truth. They're not looking for restoration. They're looking for you to stay away from their fragile shell so they can continue to, dare I say, act as posers. That's really what they are. They're, they're posers. They're not about repairing the relationship or righting the wrong. They're all about winning or losing. And they always have to win. They have to win the argument. They have to win the battle. They have to win the relationship. They always have to win. They can't lose. They have way too low of self-esteem. They are not the same type of person that you are, that you're able to back up, back away and say, you know what, God, what part did I have in that? Where did I go wrong? What is it that you want from me in this, Lord? That's not what they do. And that's why it can feel like instead of it being you and them against the problem, it's now you against them. Because the cognitive dissonance with these people is absolutely astounding. You're grounded in reality. They're dealing in a compartmentalized delusion. And if you go and try to mess with those compartments or open any of those doors, you are the problem. And when you say you want something more from the relationship than they're willing to give, they may come back at you and say, yes, I really want that. And yes, I'm willing to give that. And yes, let's really work at it. But it has to be on their terms. And it's usually very selfish terms. And they don't want to put in any effort. So let's talk just for a moment about the narcissistic narrative. Number one, it's self-focused. Number two, it's victim and number three, it's manipulative. That's exactly what you're going to get from a narcissistic narrative. Even if they are saying all the right words, it's still manipulative because all they're looking to do is get you back into their, no, all they're looking to do is to get back into your good graces. And if that's not working, they're going to resort to a victim mentality. If it is working, now it's going to resort back to their self-centeredness. So how do you handle this? Well, you could try to talk to this person and explain that what they're doing isn't accurate, but one, they're not going to receive it. Even if they say they do, they're not going to receive it. And now here's what's going to happen. They're going to take those words and one of two things is going to happen or both actually. Number one, they're going to twist them to their advantage. They're going to end up telling people that you said X, Y, Z when you really said A, B, C, or maybe you did say A, B, C or X, Y, Z, but they took it completely out of context because remember their goal is to be positioned as the victim. They've got to get others on their side. So they're going to take your words and twist them. So you could turn around and say to your narcissist, Hey, listen, you know what? I really want to be able to have a healthy relationship with you, 
But if you're not willing to give uh, X, Y, Z, you know, stop doing this or, or, you know, call me instead of me constantly calling you, then unfortunately I'm going to have to end the relationship or I'm going to have to take a step back because this is just too draining for me. Here's what they're going to hear. And they're going to go tell somebody else, oh, she said that I drain her and she doesn't want anything to do with the relationship completely out of context. So they're going to now twist this. So be careful when you find yourself trying to talk to and explain yourself to the narcissist. And number two, oftentimes what you do is you equip them to be better manipulators. How many times have you found yourself saying, oh, you know, if, if you just said this, or if you were just like this, or if you just told me this instead of that, all you're doing is teaching them how to be a better liar, manipulator, and narcissist. Guys, if you are being blessed by our time together, would you do me a huge favor and go ahead and hit that like button? I would greatly appreciate it. And if there is anyone out there that you know that is struggling in a toxic family dynamic, hit that share button because they're going to want to hear not only today's teaching, but the entire series. So narcissists do not and will not take responsibility for themselves, especially, especially if there are people out there who are going to buy into their baloney. And I've got some bad news for you, my friend. There's always going to be people out there. And that's why a lot of them succeed. And that's why it seems like a lot of times there's no justice because there's always going to be fresh supply. Even people that are healthy and intelligent enough to spot it Sometimes it takes them a little bit. And that's why sometimes even narcissists can get over on counselors because first of all, if the counselor is not educated in narcissism, forget it, you're in trouble. Just don't even bother. But secondly, you're only sitting with a counselor for what? An hour, two hours, a couple hours, a couple of times a month. You've been suffering from this for maybe, and in some cases, a lifetime. So a lot of times it was it will take a while for a, a even the most educated of counselors to be able to pick up on what's going on in that dynamic and that's why it's very very difficult and then worse and unfortunately i see this more often than not that counselors are fooled by the narcissist you know, they'll go out of their way to make sure that they're the first ones that get in the session ahead of time. They'll make sure, oh, I got to make sure I call that counselor first to fill them in on the details. My friend, they are very manipulative and they are very controlling people. And there's a lot of people out there that can be controlled. And even if it takes a while and they finally see it's just a matter of time before that person's a problem and they turn and churn and they create a new supply. Another option is you could actually step back into the relationship and give them what they want and all will be well in some distorted, demonic, fairy tale kind of way. So that is an option for you. It's not one I hope you take, but here is the option I hope you take, my friend, is that you could trust God, pray for them, and move forward with your life. The enemy loves to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his purpose. That's his aim. And that's what he's looking to do in your life. And he often uses people to derail and distract you. And my prayer is that you will not let him. In fact, I do want to pray with you. I want to pray that you will turn your focus away from these narcissists and what they're doing in your life. Pray that you will turn away from vengeance and justice, even if it's only in your own mind, and turn your attention back onto Jesus. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we just lift up holy hands and we give thanks to you, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our deliverer. Father, I ask that you would forgive us for proclaiming that you are a big and awesome God, but then we exalt these narcissists far above you as though they have some power that you can't conquer, as though your justice 
can't reach that situation with that person. Oftentimes we can even look at the narcissist that is beyond redemption. It's beyond hope. But Father, all things are possible with you. There is no person that is outside of your reach. It is your heart that none would perish. So Father, right now I pray for each and every narcissist in each and every person's life under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray that you would quicken their spirit. Father, I pray that you would pull at their heartstrings. Father, I pray that you would till the soil of their soul, that they would open up their heart and mind to receiving you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Father, that they would give up on their controlling nature. Lord, I pray that they would stop allowing the enemy to use them as pawns in his plan, and they would completely surrender their lives to you. Father, reach your hand out once again. I ask that you would not give up on them. And Father, as we turn our attention and our prayer to, to us, I pray for that one watching right now whose focus has been completely on the narcissist and their behavior. I pray, Lord, that they would recognize right now that they are actually giving more attention to Satan than they are to you. You're the God of justice. Your word says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. And Father, I pray that they would just rest in your mighty hand, trust in your sovereignty, and turn their focus towards what you've called them to do in life, not with what the enemy is trying to prevent them to do. Father, we surrender our hearts, we surrender our minds, and we surrender ourselves into your great care. It is in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. My friend, if you agree with me, can you say amen? So as you know, if you've been with us on this journey, we are taking questions, not in the traditional way where we capture the live ones, but we're actually taking questions from our previous live stream. So if you do have questions, don't hesitate. Put them in the chat or in the comment section below. Just make sure you put some question marks before and after so we can spot them easier. And then we could potentially be answering them on one of our upcoming episodes in the remaining 12 toxic days of Christmas. So the first question that came in was in response to yesterday's teaching. And we had talked about how the narcissist likes to use special occasions to try and reconnect with you. And this question came in asking, what do you do if they left a gift on my doorknob? So in the case of narcissists using these special uh, occasions is that their main objective is to just get back into your life. Whether you call it hoovering or control or just lining up their supply, their goal is to get you back in. And what better way than in such an innocent way such as a happy birthday text or a Merry Christmas gift left at your front door by somebody who clearly has forgiven you even though you've not forgiven them. My friend, I do pray that you sense the seeping sarcasm in my tone as I say this because that's how they think even though that's not the reality. So what do you do with a gift that was left behind by the narcissist? Well, there's a few things you can do. Number one, you can take it and you can say thank you. If you say thank you, my friend, you better be prepared because you just gave the enemy a foothold. So not my suggestion. However, the next thing that you can do is to just take the gift and give it away. Go bless somebody else with it, or you can take it and throw it in the garbage if that's symbolic for you. Or you could reach out and say, I received your gift. I no longer want your gifts. Please don't send any more. And then in the future, you can just discard them. So there is nothing right or wrong. It's really about what your preference is. So I would, I would suggest being very prayerful and careful because if you're acting out of viciousness or unforgiveness or bitterness, then it doesn't matter what your response is. It's not okay. But if you're acting out of love, then it doesn't matter what your response is. It is okay. 
So definitely be prayerful over what God would have you do in that situation. However, there is nothing wrong with saying that I, I just don't want this and I'm not going to open that door again. But just remember that they are going to now twist this because they did something nice and you didn't respond in kind. The next question is, what do I do when someone will not let me cut off their supply? And again, this is in response to, I think it was yesterday's teaching where that's what they're looking for. They're, the narcissist wants your supply, even if they just have to keep you on the back burner. So the question, what do I do if they will not let me cut off their supply? That's not possible. That, that's like saying they won't let me stop eating. It, it's your supply. You can cut it off or give it all you want. So I just want you to keep that in mind. That's not possible. What is taking place, and this, this might be a little bit of a, a hard hook, is you're giving in to whatever they're dishing out. You're giving in to the guilt or the manipulation or the control or whatever it is, but the truth is, is you're giving into it. And by saying that they're not letting me actually positions you as the victim, which isn't accurate because again, like I said before, that's like saying they're not letting me stop eating. I mean, they, nobody can force me to eat something. I mean, through extreme violence, perhaps they can, but I think you guys get my point. They can't force you to give them narcissistic supply. So this is yours. This is on you. You have to own this. You have to recognize the area in which you're giving in, the, the tactics that you're caving into, and now take that to the Lord and say, Lord, how do I not get manipulated by this? How do I prevent being pulled into this, uh, demonic dynamic and how do I respond without supplying? And if that response means nothing at all, then the Holy Spirit is going to lead you in that direction. Okay. The next question is for you. How has the narcissist in your life tried to control you? Let me know in the comments. My friends, if you are feeling like a doormat and you want to learn how to set godly guiltless boundaries. I want to invite you to check out our course called Biblical Boundaries with Toxic Family. In fact, it's not even just for toxic family. It is for any toxic person in your life that you need to learn how to say no to without guilt. And I'm really excited to announce, but this offer is expiring soon, that that course, along with every single other course in our collection, from conquering codependency to renewing your mind, all the way over to being delivered from demonic influence is all on sale for 20% off. But this offer is going to expire on Friday. So don't wait. Jump on over to the link that we will pop in the chat. My friend, if you're watching on the replay, it will be down in the description section below. Simply put in code HOLIDAY20 and you will get 20% off of any and all courses that you purchase before this Friday, December 23rd. And if you are curious about the seven gaslighting phrases that manipulators use to try to control you, go ahead and check out this video right here. So my friend, I am hoping that you will join me tomorrow for day 11 of our 12 toxic days of Christmas as we talk about the six signs that you need to break away from toxic family.